So how many are ready to receive the word today? Yeah. Amen. Awesome. So uh, why don't we just stand one time as we're just going to pray, um, and we're going to go for it. Father, we thank you for your word today, God. We thank you, Lord, that it has the power to change us, transform us, Lord, and we, we're willing to uh, hear what you're saying to our hearts today, Lord. Let us not be offended by your word, but let us embrace it, God, and, and let us um, conform to it because it has the power to save our souls. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. You may be seated. All right. So what I'm going to try to do is just do a quick review of where we've been the last three weeks and then head right into the message today. And uh, I've been talking about being ambassadors of grace. Amen. Um, we, we, I did have a water bottle here, honey, if you want to get that. So we were talking the last few weeks about being ambassadors of grace. And um, uh, I talked about what grace was first and foremost. Okay. Grace is God's divine influence upon our heart. Okay. Bible says that the spirit of grace has come upon our hearts, right? The spirit of God comes, and we call the Holy Spirit the spirit of grace. So grace has been imparted. So God's divine influence upon our hearts, is his, his, that's what his grace is. It's also known as his unmerited favor, okay? And the grace that we've received is not a grace that we want to cap, okay? The grace that we received has been given to us so that it can freely flow through us. Jesus said to his disciples, freely you have received, freely and so if we're not giving of the grace that God has given us, guess what? We, we become stagnant and dry. We begin to move into just behavior modification, and we move through the systems of our religion, and we get away from the faith that's born by the spirit of grace. And so as a people, we always have to remind ourselves of our need for God's divine influence. We need to be a people of prayer. We need to be a people who pursue the heart of God, because as we do... God's divine influence, God's divine grace begins to flow in deeper levels, okay? First week, we also talked about the fact that if we're ambassadors, we need to understand what, what an ambassador is, right? We talked about this, and I'll just touch it briefly, is immigrants are those who come to a land, and they have to come under the custom and culture and the laws of the land, and they assimilate in, but an ambassador is one who goes to a land to establish the culture, the laws of the land they've come from. And so God has called us to bring the kingdom of God to the earth. Amen. So we're here. We're coming into the world. Now you're saved out of the world, but now you come back into the world to establish the culture of heaven, to establish the kingdom. That's why Jesus said, as it is in heaven, so let it be done on earth. God wants heaven here on earth. Amen. And so we're ambassadors of the culture of heaven, which is grace. God's divine influence is going to flow in Trenton. That's my word today. All right. Number two, the second slide says here, the grace that we've received from the Lord, we're to extend to other people. Second Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able. Say, God is able. He's able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, say all things. Let's, read it, let's just read the whole thing together. That all things at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. And so God's grace is the fuel that drives us, that moves us through life, that makes us ambassadors for God. Amen? So God is calling us to be ambassadors of grace and to bring the gospel. All right? The first week we talked about seven ways that we demonstrate grace to others. We talked about not receiving the grace of God in vain. We talked about grace, how it increases when we pray, and this is just a summary. Week number two, we spoke about extending grace to the non-believer or the uninformed, okay? That's the third slide. And so God has, um, he wants us to extend grace to the non-believer and the uninformed. And I say the uninformed because an uninformed person is one who has never heard the gospel presented correctly. How many have ever met someone like that? And they, they think they understand Jesus. They think they understand God, but they never really understood the cross. And so there's a whole bunch of people out there that need to hear your testimony of how God changed you, how God transformed you, and what, what the cross is all about, and uh, about the love of God. They don't understand. And so it's our responsibility to bring the gospel. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 to 21 says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. Say, we are. Christ's ambassadors. And so this is what's happening. God is making his appeal through you and I. God is making his appeal through us 
and, 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 and the, the apostle says, we speak for Christ when we plead with people, come back to God. And, 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 and for God has made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we can be made right with God through who? Through Jesus Christ. And so it's our responsibility to appeal or plead with people to come back to God. And I don't know about you, but I don't know a lot of Christians that are busy going about their life appealing and trying to plead with people to come back to Christ. And you know what? We've got a whole world of people that are far from God, and God wants to reach them. God wants to touch their lives. Amen? The word appeal means to call to one side. Okay? Right? Next slide. To call to one side, call for, or to ask someone to come near. Okay? So when we're appealing for people to come to God, we're actually calling them near to God. We're calling them near to the gospel. Say, come here. Come on over here. I want to bring you near to God. Once they get near to God, then God can speak to them. Once you get them near to God, they can begin to connect their heart with God. Amen. Our job is not to win souls. Our job is to bring people near to God. And then you never fail. Whether you're just praying with somebody whether you're just helping someone and sharing your testimony, whether you, uh, you, you, share, you share something about Jesus and they spit in your face, you win. Because your job isn't to save them. Your job is to draw them near to God. And they, then they have to decide. Amen? And I remember once I was in St. Catharines and I was on the street evangelizing. And I walked up to this guy and he goes, hey, man, he goes, can I have a light? And he was a rough-looking guy. He says, Long hair, leather jacket. He says, do you have a light? And I said, no, but I have the light. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I got Jesus Christ, man. And God has a bunch of promises for your life. And I started witnessing, and he, he just, I could see him. He went, and he and just horked right in my face. And I'm going to tell you, in the natural, I just wanted to deck him. <laughs> I just wanted. And I was just like, this is my opportunity to let my sin nature out. You know, I was so excited. And then I said, no, no, no. And I, I, I literally just wiped it off. I said, you know what? Listen, God loves you. I'm here to tell you about his love. And, and he said, well, why are you being so nice to me? I just spit on you, man. And then he, he actually sat and listened to me share, and he began to weep. He got saved. He was a satanic high priest in a church and up in that area. He was, he, was, he was into Satanism. He came to church, got saved, started getting his life cleaned off, and then, then he moved away to, and went to another church. But it was all because... I took the time to call someone near to God's atmosphere. That's all it was. And so we need to be a people who know how to appeal and draw people near to God. Amen? And so number, go to the next slide here. It says here, we, we call people near. There's different ways we can do it. We can call people near through exhortation. Say exhortation. Okay? The first thing with exhortation, and this is, um, I covered last week, so I'm going to go really quick through it. To exhort someone means you're urging them to do something. There's an urgency, all right? There has to be an urgency in our hearts for the unsaved, amen? Because they're going to hell. If they don't know Jesus, they're separated from God for eternity. There has to be an urgency. It doesn't mean you have to yell at people. It doesn't mean you have to come across rude. It doesn't mean that you're unloved. But you have to say, listen, God, I, I care about you. There's an urgency. You need to come near to God, Amen? And so it's, it's through exhortation we urge people to come. The second one is we call people through entreaty. The word entreaty actually means to ask someone to urgently do something. So you move from urging someone, saying, hey, this is a real good idea, you should do it, to actually saying, would you just get saved already? There, there has to be an entreaty. There has to be an asking people urgently to move into that place of commitment. Everyone got it? The third one is we, are call, we call people near through compassion or through, through, uh, through compassion or through comfort. Matthew chapter 14, verse 14, it says here, when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them and he healed their sick. Why did Jesus feel compassion for people? The next verse tells us in Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. People without Jesus, there's, you can be going through life and you got everything good on the outside and 
you're pretty good sometimes even on the inside, but there's a sense of confusion about your identity and where you're going to spend eternity and what life is about. And Jesus had compassion for people. And as, as a people of God, we have to have compassion for people and share our testimony. So, you know, once I was confused, once I didn't know these answers, but now there's an assurance of my salvation. There has to be compassion, all right? Um, so we call people through appeal. We call them through entreaty. We call them through comforting them. Comforting means you're willing to bring a meal. You're willing to pray for people. You're willing to help them go through their time of trial. No strings attached. If you think about it, Jesus went out and he preached to the multitudes. He healed their sick. He prayed for them because he had compassion. Do you think every single one of those people gave their hearts to Jesus? Because Jesus was there to say, here, I want you to draw near to God. This is what he looks like. Now you choose. And that's our responsibility, to call people near to God. Amen? All right. So here's, the, here's the, another way that we can, we can call people near, and that's through instruction. We need to study and give a reason for the hope we have. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always prepare to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Do this with gentleness and re with respect. And so there has to be in us a preparedness to give an account. And, you know, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. There's been times where I run into people and, I start, and, and I'd be like, oh, I wish, I wish I had that answer. I wish I would have studied a little harder. How many know what I'm talking about, right? And, and, and it's okay to say people, you know, I don't have that answer, but let me go back and look at the word and let's get together again and talk about it. But how many know there's a need to educate yourself with the word? Right, Paul? You just came from Bible school? Right, Luke? Sorry, Paul. Apostle Paul, Apostle Luke, you know, whatever. No, but you just, you just came, you, Paul's your dad, but you just came from Bible college. And so there's something to be said for obtaining knowledge from the word. Educate yourself. Get to know the scriptures. Know why you're saved and how it works so you can share it with people, okay? And so we have to. Um, but there's, there's one more way we call people near, and I want to just hit on that quickly, and then we're going to look at God's heart, okay? We call people near through or by the Holy Spirit's power, okay? A lot of people forget this one. We, we can preach people. We can, we can exhort them to come to God. We can, we, can, we, can, we can ask them to just make a decision. We can comfort them in their trials to show them the love of God. We can, we can give them biblical instruction to why they need to get saved. But, but the, the last one is just as important. We need to draw people by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's why Jesus said to the guys in Jerusalem, his disciples, he said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with what? Power from on high so that you might be witnesses. Not just witnesses of my message, but witnesses of the culture of heaven that's going to penetrate the earth sphere. It's going to come through. There's going to be signs, wonders, and miracles. What happens in heaven is going to happen on earth, and that's how you're going to be a witness. Amen? So how many know the power of the Holy Spirit is very, very important? All right? 1 Corinthians chapter 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It's living by God's power. That's what it is. It's living by God's power, having a life that's been transformed by the power of God's spirit. You know, the Christian life is fun. It's a life that is the, the supernatural. I could tell you story after story of how God has intervened in my life uh, supernaturally with the life of my children. Um, and, and it's powerful. And it, it just makes your witness and your testimony that much more powerful. Amen? But evangelism is a lifestyle of compassionately calling people to God's side. It's, it's not just a message. It, it's, it's introducing the atmosphere of heaven, and this attracts people to God. That's what it does. I've had times in my life where I've been around people, and they say, and I've literally said, there's something different about you. You're not like us. Why do you, I feel peace when I'm around you. How many have ever had that kind of a comment made? And, you know, if you haven't, you're not hanging around the unsaved enough. But if you do, just that's just a little burn I, yeah that wasn't very loving but you will get that comment once in a while and what is that that is god's that is god's spirit amen you either get that or you get people saying you're holier than thou because they feel they feel convicted because you're because because god's holiness is with you amen you get one of the two but you can change an atmosphere when you walk in a room if you know god in romans chapter 15 
verse 19, it says this. They were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's spirit. In this way, Paul says, I have fully presented the gospel of Jesus Christ from Jerusalem all the way to that funny town I can't pronounce. And so he was saying basically signs and wonders and miracles. When, you're, when there's signs, wonders, and miracles and supernatural things happening, you're fully presenting the good news. Did you hear me? It's not just a message. It's a demonstration that God has intervened in your life, that God's divine influence has come down upon your heart, that God is the one who's setting you free. God is able to deliver you from addiction. He's able to deliver you from fears. He's able to transform your marriage. He's able to transform your body. He's able to do all it. And when that stuff starts happening, it becomes a powerful testimony that God is with you. And that's what sets us apart from all the other world religions is that we're supposed to have this connection, not a connection, but a God, our God living inside of us and doing miracles through us. And, you know, 60% of the different churches out there are afraid of the power of the Holy Spirit. And they try to just go back and say, oh, it's just about exhorting and it's just about entreating and it's just, you know, it's just about comforting people into the kingdom. But the power thing, let's stay away from that because we don't quite understand that. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We talked last week in Acts chapter 5, verse 14 and 16. I don't have the scripture up there, um, Gabe, but Peter's shadow would actually heal people. And my, my understanding of that, the way I see that, it says in Psalm 91, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I almost see like God in an invisible form walking with Peter and his God's shadow would overshadow Peter's shadow, and as he walked by people, they would get healed. Because Peter knew how to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Peter knew how to pray, and when he went to pray, he spent intimate time with God, and when he did that, the Spirit's power and the grace began to increase. Grace began to flow. Grace became to increase. Amen? How many know God's no respecter of person? If he did it then, he'll do it now. So what I wanted to do for fun here is I want to look at a couple examples from history. Uh, I taught revival history in Bible school, and I really love to look at his back history and read stories. So I'm going to read a little bit to you. The, the next slide here is a, a man named Charles Finney, and uh, he was a revivalist um, in the Second Great Awakening, and many say he was responsible for kickstarting it. This was in New York in Utica, and this is what he said. This is something that he wrote. Finney says, the most amazing display of God's power in his life came one day as he went to visit a cotton factory at New York Mills, just a small town near Utica. Prior to his visit to the factory, more than 500 converts were reported saved in a very short time that he had been in Utica. So everyone in the area had heard what was going on, and the people were divided, and a great number of those against the meeting were openly opposing it. So as Finney walked into a cotton mill one day, one of the opponents of the meetings a young lady employee saw him. Looking at her co-employee, she began to laugh at him. And some writers say she made a cynical remark about Finney and his meetings. In a spirit of prayer, Charles Finney simply looked at the young lady. Without saying a word, as he kept looking at her, he was grieved by her criticism. And the lady stopped working as she had broken her thread. She, began, she became so upset that she couldn't repair the thread and start again because the Holy Spirit of God mightily began to convict her of her sins to the point where she began to weep. Soon her companions were convicted and began to weep and a chain reaction occurred as hundreds began to be overcome by their lost condition without God. The factory owner saw what was going on, all of a sudden was touched by the Holy Spirit. And he said, stop the mill and let the people attend to religion, for it's far more important that our souls be saved than the factory run. All the workers were assembled in a large room, and Finney said, a more powerful meeting I had ever, I've never attended. And within a few days, nearly every employee was saved. Some accounts say that there, they, that there was 3,000 employees in the factory. 3,000 people. Because a man walked in the atmosphere of heaven. And he was able to walk into a place, and he has such a deep place of prayer and intimacy with God that when he walked into a room and he just looked at someone with, with, with prayerful look, they break down. 3,000 people saved, not a word spoken. There's something to be said about the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that saves the soul, amen? 
He comes and speaks to us. There's another one I want to talk about just briefly here. It's Mariah Woodworth Etter. I don't know if you've heard about her. But uh, Sister Etter had been told that it was too late for Hartford City. And her ministry would never find roots in the city of sin. They called it the city of sin, the preacher's graveyard. No church could ever be birthed there. There was too much sin. There was too much alcoholism. There was too much uh, uh, violence. It was just that city will never be saved. Newspapers reported. Newspaper reporters tell of Sister Edder went out. She stood on a stump near near a cornfield. And um, for the crowd had outgrown the small building. And with one hand holding her Bible and the other hand lifted towards heaven, suddenly she froze like a statue before the mocking throng. Hours passed into another day, and she continued to stand silent and still, not moving a muscle before the ever-growing crowd of mockers. She literally went into a trance and stood for a day in one spot. So people would come and say, what is this woman doing? And they stood around, and they would mock her. Okay? Suddenly, she awoke and began to preach under the great anointing of the Holy Spirit. People were slain in the Spirit, falling into what the media would call a trance. There were many he healings. Hundreds were saved, many being the very ones who came to mock her because of the many occasions of people they were falling in the spirit. The media began to refer to her as the trance evangelist. These people would go into a trance, and they'd come back, and they had, been in, they had visited hell, and they'd be like, I need to get saved, or they would have a vision of heaven or something. God began to move where this woman moved, and the atmosphere began to change. Isn't that amazing? Her meetings would start at 9 o'clock in the morning and continue till 12 o'clock at night. We could not close. There were so many outside. When one went out, another came in. Sinners were struck down at their homes and along the highways. They were saved for miles around. They said that they'd have her, her tent meeting set up, and as a train would go by, uh, half a mile away, as a train went by that vicinity or that area where God's presence was moving, people would be standing on the train, and all of a sudden, boom, they'd fall on the floor and couldn't move until the train had passed. They'd get back up and go, what was that? Because God's tangible power came down where this woman preached. Mariah Woodworth ever prof uh, prophesied that around the end of July 1913, that um, within 100 years, there would be a greater outpouring of the Spirit than what we'd ever seen. And so apparently in 2014, God was supposed to start moving again. How many want to claim that? God wants to move in powerful revival. Amen. Documented cases by doctors, including invalids walking from their sick beds, the deaf hearing, the blind saw, Arthritis was healed instantly. Tumors were destroyed. Diseases of dropsy was eliminated in the name of Jesus. Uh, Maria was uh, emphatic about taking no credit for what, what God was doing. Uh, people, you know, just miracle after miracle after miracle. People were cured of cancer. Uh, she'd have an altar call, and the altar would be filled with sick people, and she would go around and praying for them. One, one guy had a cancer, a kid had a cancerous tumor on his neck. And they said, what are we going to do? We, and she said, bring him up on stage. I'm going to cut it off with the sword of the Spirit. And she took her Bible, and she hit him in the neck, and the thing disappeared, and he was completely healed. <laughs> Amen? And so how many know God? We need the power of the Holy Spirit. All right? God is able to do these things today because he's done them in the past, and he's the same, what, yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Many said this was the greatest the uh, greatest outpouring of miracles since the day of Pentecost. And 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20 says, For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It's living by God's power. Amen? And so how many know we need the power of the Holy Spirit if we're going to be effective in being ambassadors of grace? Well, give the Lord a hand. And so what I like is how Jesus saw this as something important as well. Because he, in, in, in the end of the book of Luke, he breathes on his disciples. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. So they already had the Holy Spirit. But then he says, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And then you're going to go to the rest of the world. Well, Jerusalem was their home, right? Stay at home base. Get empowered in the secret place of prayer get encountering the Holy Spirit, and then you go out in power. And I want to say this is the same for us today. 
you have to take time to tarry at home. Amen? If we're going to see revival in our families, in our lives, in our churches, we need to learn to tarry in the secret place, in our homes. It doesn't mean you don't evangelize without power. You, you evangelize because that's what you do. But, but you always have to be tearing and say, Lord, I need more. I need more. I need more. Spend time in intimate prayer with God. We become endued with power in Jerusalem in the secret place in intimate prayer. I don't know if I told you guys this story, but when I was teaching revival history at Bible school, um, I did the, uh, they wanted me to do more. I finished the course, and they said, okay, can we do more? So I talked to, to the pastor and to the dean of students. I said, okay, well, let's put together a course, and we're going to call it Principles of Revival. So now I'll go through all the revivalists, and we'll look at the principles they applied to their lives in order to see supernatural things. So I did that, and I got to this. Uh, what, I, what I found was John Wesley, George Whitfield, D.L. Moody, uh, John Wesley. Did I say John Wesley? Yeah. Um, William Booth, all of these guys had something. They had a time of prayer that was, like, incredible. And uh, John Wesley would pray, and George Whit I think it was George Whitfield would pray for 15 to 17 hours before he would preach. He would just lock himself away and just pray and spend time with God until he felt the power of the Holy Spirit. And he'd get up and preach. 100,000 people would come and listen to him without a microphone, and he would preach the gospel. The power of God would come. People would get saved. Okay, that's, that was... So I was teaching this. And I have this student sitting there, Jermaine Jackson, you remember? He's sitting there, and he goes, he comes up to me, he goes, Hey, he goes, I don't have a job right now. I only go to Bible school during the day. So I'm going to do what these guys did. I'm going to pray 15 hours a day. And I said, okay, all right, Jermaine, that's great. So what happens a few months later, he's doing this. And all of a sudden, he's got this following of like 26 guys and girls following him around, young people, millennials. So I don't know. I got all these people saved now. What do I do? And, uh, well, tell me what happened. He goes, well, I did what you said. And I started praying 15 hours a day and seeking God. And it, it, was, it was boring, it was hard, and it was tough, but I kept doing it. And then one day I heard the voice of God say, I love you, you're my son. I heard his voice, it was audible. And ever since I heard his voice, God's power has come upon me. And he goes, I go to the beach, and I say, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? And, or can I pray with you? And he said, he was praying with a group of people on the beach. And as he began to pray, the power of God came down. And they all, we had all these bikini-cladded bodies all laying out in the Holy Ghost, just knocked out <laughs> under the power of God. And they get up and say, what happened? Well, that's the Holy Spirit. Well, we want that. And they got saved. Joined his church. He goes down the street. He's, everybody he's talking to, he's praying for them. Miracles are happening. Miracles are happening everywhere. People are getting healed. And he's all excited. And so I said, well, come talk to the youth. Because I don't have 15 hours a day to pray. And you do. So come and talk to my youth because they're all messed up. So he comes. He comes, to the, he comes to the altar. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And we invited a bunch of unsaved kids. They're all sitting in the four or five or six of them sitting there. And he's preaching the gospel. And, and they're laughing, right? They're kind of like, and they're kind of mocking a bit. And he, he looked at them. He goes, you guys stand up. He goes, the Holy Spirit's real. I'm telling you. And they're like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, he grabbed his jacket. And he pulled a Benny Hinn. I, I'd never seen this before. <laughs> grabbed his jacket. And he threw it at them. And when it hit them, the whole section of the youth went boom under the power of God. And they're all laying on the floor shaking like chickens. And then these guys got up. And they're like, what was that all about? What was that all about? That was, I couldn't move, and it was like it felt so good. But what was, that's God's Holy Spirit. Like, hey, we want to know more. And they sat down, and they listened to the message. Some of those kids are serving God today. Right? So, so, so as you spend time with God, the more time you spend in secret prayer time with God, in fellowship with the Father, not in striving prayer, just time talking to God, being friendly with God, letting him be not only your father but your friend, and talk to him about, and have secret prayer time. Empowerment comes. Grace comes. Amen? Awesome. So, let's talk about this together here. Next slide, verse 17, or number 17. So, how do we extend grace to the unsaved and the uninformed? Say, through exhortation, through entreaty, through comforting, through instruction, and by the Holy Spirit's power. Amen? All right. So, we have to understand that that's our job description as believers. The, the, it's amazing to think of this, but someone's last words are always the most important words, or usually are, okay? And Jesus, before he went back to the Father, he said, this is what he said to his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you, and lo, I'm with you even till the ends of the age. Amen? And I want to just break this down, because this is our job description. Say, this is our job description. 
It's what God wants us to do, okay? Let's look at this. He wants us to fully immerse people in the Father, in the Father's love. They need to understand who the Father is. We need to fully immerse people in the Father. We need to fully immerse people in the, in the Son. And we have to fully immerse people in God's power, okay? His baptism means fully immersed. Now, I understand we're talking about water baptism, but here's the point. We, if people can understand the love of God and they understand the salvation that the Son brings and the relationship that the Holy Spirit brings, they're going to walk this thing out. So our first responsibility is to fully immerse people in the Trinity so they understand who they are. Number two, he wants us to teach people to observe, say observe, all the commandments of Jesus. This is not just about saying a prayer and saying, you know what, I'm going to get to heaven one day and I'll go to church, you know, a couple times a month, you know, I'll just do my own thing. No, it's about observing the commandments of Jesus, being transformed by Jesus, letting your light so shine, amen? We're, we're being transformed from glory to glory. And, and, and so it's about observing the commandments of Jesus. And the third thing is that we need to be aware that he said, I'm with you. This is not something you're doing by yourself. I'm with you by my precious spirit. He's going to be your comforter. He's going to comfort you. He's going to counsel you. He's going to empower you. You're not doing this thing alone. And, and, and that's our, our commission. God wants us to go into all the world. And in order to do that, we need to understand how passionate God is um, to expand his kingdom and to make disciples. You know, God is passionate about people. And if we would only understand that. And so in order to do that, we're going to close here with three simple parables that Jesus told, and they're all together. And I'm going to call it the sheep, the coin, and the sun. Okay? He's going to tell a parable about a sheep. Then he's going to tell a parable about a coin. And he's going to tell a parable about a son. We're going to start in Luke chapter 15, verse 1 to 3. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. And this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with, with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. And here's the thing. There are churches out there where sinners come in and the Christians feel like, why are they here? Now, I praise God. I pray we, we never become that kind of a church because we got to remember where we came from, right? We've all came from the same cesspool, okay? We've all, we've all come from that place, all right? We're all working out our salvation. We're working with, with our relationship with God. But look what Jesus says in Luke 15, 4 and 7. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which he lost until what? Until he finds it. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. All right? This is the heart of God. Likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And what this passage of scripture tells me is that God leaves the sheep shed to find the sheep. And so we come together here at church, and this is a great place. The Bible says the church is the place where we're, we're to be trained and equipped for the work of the what? For the work of the, for the ministry to go out there to leave the sheep shed, okay? And so we leave the sheep shed because God has left the sheep shed. He's not here. He's out trying to seek and save that which is lost. Okay? Our greatest adventures in God are just beyond the doors. I, I'm telling you, your greatest, my greatest stories, the most exciting times of my spiritual life is when I had an opportunity to pray with someone who's not saved, pray for someone who's sick, who doesn't know God, to share my testimony, to just love on somebody who doesn't know God. Those are the greatest Th those are the, the greatest spiritual nourishing moments because God is with me and he just shows up because he's not here. He's out there. And if we can get this in our spirit this morning, that your greatest adventure is just outside the door. It, it's the person you're going to run into. And the other thing I learned from this passage is there's more joy in the harvest field than in the sheep shed. Right? I'm using that in case you haven't picked it up. It's the church, the sheep shed, because we're sheep, you know. Um, 
but there's joy. When we come together, guys, and, and we have wonderful worship like we had this morning, guys, and we enter in and we listen to the word and we talk with one another, we pray with one another, there's joy in God's heart. He looks down and he goes, I, I'm so full of joy. But the Bible says there's more joy. When one person turns their heart to Jesus, then when 140, whatever we are, 140 people get together and worship, there's more joy. So I want to be in where God is. Where, where's God? He's, he's out trying to seek and save that which is lost, okay? God takes more joy in saving sinners than receiving worship. God takes more joy in saving sinners than us sitting and receiving his word. God takes more joy in reaching those who are lost. He's willing to leave the 99. Why? Because he knows we have one another. We already, we're already saved, but there's those who are lost, amen? And Luke chapter 15, verse 8 to 9, Jesus gives us another analogy. What woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, okay? And uh, she says, rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there's more joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know what this passage tells me? It tells me, number one, that if I pulled out 10 loonies, put them on this counter, every single loonie has equal value. But if one of those loonies went missing and I needed 10 bucks to buy lunch, I would take the nine, because they're already mine, and I would secure them in my pocket. But I would look for that other coin because it has the exact same value as the other nine. That is to say that when God looks down upon the earth, he sees your value, he sees my value, but he equally values the person just walked by this church who lives next door to you, who works with you. He equally values that person, and he's wanting them to come in, and so we need to go. Isn't that good? And if we're looking at this analogy properly, God celebrates with the angels. You see, the woman calls her neighbors and friends and says, hey, let's celebrate, let's have a party, let's party because someone, I just found my lost coin. The Bible says there's more joy in heaven. So I see that God is, God is talking to the angels. Hey, someone else got saved. Yeah, they're partying, woo, right? They're excited, why? Because they found, you know, that's really, if you think about it, there's thousands of people every day that give their heart to Christ, kneeling at a bedside, standing at an altar, talking to one of you. Could you imagine? Heaven must be a permanent party. Like it must be, God is like partying. Yeah, let's celebrate great joy. Woo, you know, that's, you know, it must be a happy place because people are getting saved all over the place. It changes your perspective, amen? All right, last parable and then I'm gonna close. Luke 15, verse 11 to 20. Now, when we're looking at this parable, um, I'm just gonna summarize 11 to 20 so we don't have to look it up. There's a certain man had two sons. This is the story of the prodigal. The younger said, give me my portion now. I don't want to wait till I'm old and, you know, I don't want to wait to get my inheritance. I want it now. So he took his, so the father gave it to him. He journeyed far away to another country. He blew his inheritance and with wasteful living and he began to be in want. And then he ended up at the bottom of the barrel feeding pigs. Right? You guys know the story. And then he was so hungry he had to eat the pods himself. And this is where we're going to take it off. Luke chapter 15, verse 17 to 21. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of the hired servants. Okay? And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell and kissed him. Okay? And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Luke chapter 15, verse 22 to 23. But the father said to his servant, Bring our best robe, put it on him, bring a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf here, let's kill it, and let us eat and be merry. So God is really, really excited. And this, this is the heart of God. This is the heart of God for people. And if, if we're going to bring it to today, I want to say this. At ATC, people will come in. This door, the back door, some of your small groups, 
some of your encounters as you're out during the week, you're representing God, okay? And people are coming in, and what they're carrying is they're carrying their regret, they're carrying their shame. Just like this, this, this prodigal son, he knew he blew it. He came back and goes, you know, I feel so bad. How's my dad going to accept me? He's not, he's not going to want me because I messed up, and maybe he'll make me a slave or a servant. He's coming with his head down. And the father saw him, and he ran out to meet him, and he hugged him and kissed him. So what we're going to do is we're going to run to people, and we're going to hug them and kiss them. Well, hold off on the kissing. No kissing. But you can embrace people where they're at. Amen? And the father heard the repentance and didn't say, yes, but you need to repent for this and this. Remember when you did this? And you, I was right, wasn't I? So he didn't do any of that. He just said he received the forgiveness. He embraced his son. And he brought him into the family. At ATC, we see people a long way off. We need to run to them. We have to have compassion. We have to hug them in their shame. We need to hug them, in, not even just a physical hug, but we have to embrace people in their shame. And they're coming in with shame and guilt and feeling filthy. And we got to embrace them and say, we accept you. I'm a work in progress, and you know what? Now you are. But we're doing this thing together. There has to be this embrace, amen? Okay. Um, so here, here's the thing. Repentance involves, I'm going to break this down, and then we're going to close. Realizing our need to turn from the direction we have been following. And that's what the prodigal son did. He was going in this direction. He realized, hey, this is not right. He turned and started going in a different direction. Number two, you have to return to the Father's house to ask forgiveness. That's what he did. He went back to the Father's house to ask forgiveness. Number three, he received face-to-face -face relationship with the Father. All right? And that's what it's about, intimacy with the Father. Then God's kingdom or the Father's kingdom is restored to the prodigal son and is released through him. And that's the same way with us. We come to God. We realize we have to turn from our sin. We have to return to the Father's house to ask forgiveness. God immediately forgives us. We have a face-to-face -face relationship with the Father again. And then God restores the kingdom of God to us as his sons and daughters, not as slaves and servants. Does that make sense? And so as people are coming to this place, as people are coming to your small group, as you're meeting people on the streets and witnessing to them, you have to embrace them in their shame. You have to tell them your story. You have to give them an opportunity to realize that God is not holding their sin against them, that he's paid a price. He's already sent his son to die in their place. And that all they have to do is receive him, and then he'll bring healing, and he'll bring deliverance. Amen? And that's the gospel that we carry. Amen? If you're going to clap, clap good. All right? <laughs> Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 15, verse 25 to 28, there's an older brother in the story. And the older son was in a field, and he came and drew near to the house, and he heard the music and the dancing. So he called out to the servant and asked, what do these things mean? And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he's received him safe and sound, your father has killed a fattened calf. But the older son was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said, please come on in. He wouldn't go into the father's house. He was too busy working with the slaves and servants. He didn't have an identity anymore as a son of God. He had an identity as, as a servant. He couldn't even go to the father himself. He had to ask another servant, hey, what, what's the father doing? What's he up to? How many Christians do that? I got to go and ask some guy to prophesy over me or tell me what he thinks God's will is for my life. Go to the father yourself. He'll talk to you, I promise. You don't have to chase a prophet. You don't have to chase people to, for direction for your life. Go to the Father in the secret place. Daddy, I love you. I've messed up. I'm a goofball sometimes. But what's your direction for my life? And he will speak to you. That's our Father. But the son, the older son, lost that. He became religious. He was going through all the motions like the church of Ephesus, but he left his first love. And he was working with the slaves. He was working with the servants, but he had no relationship with Daddy anymore. And this is what happens here. Okay? Um, the older brother Christian um, and this is important when I hit this the older brother Christian always was busy working for God he became God's policeman he, he identified with the servants 
Uh, he wasn't comfortable with close relationships anymore. And what he did was he pointed out his brother's past sins. Look at Luke chapter 15, verse 29. This is our last verse. Okay, it says here, So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might be merry with my friend. But as soon as this son of yours comes, he doesn't say, as soon as my brother comes back. Has anyone ever done that? You're talking to your spouse. Goes, this is your son, you know. Um, <laughs> so anyway, he says here, uh, but as soon as the son of yours comes, who's devoured your livelihood with harlots, you kill the fat and calf for him? And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. You, in other words, you can come into that. You, you're out there slaving with the servants. You could be living like a king. You could be coming into the home and talking with me, having fellowship, knowing what's going on. You don't have to talk to the other servants. You can talk to me. You can go to the fridge. You can help yourself. You can have, you can have a, a party in the home here as long as it's a good one. You know, No problem. Uh, it's all good, son. You, you are my son. And then God doesn't even, the father doesn't even mess with the foolishness of trying to explain. He says this one statement. He says, okay, son, you're always with me. All that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again, and he's lost and he's found. And I will say this, it is right that we make merry and we're glad if people come into this life, into this church, and they give their heart to Jesus Christ. Amen? It is right. And we got, there's a whole bunch of movements in the Christ, Christian church right now that is kind of trying to get people to reach a certain level uh, before they can be accepted. And the thing is, we're accepted because of what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. Amen?